Can you remember the last time that you fell madly in love with a stranger? Did it feel like instant connection or instant projection? How about the opposite end of the emotional spectrum? Can you remember the last time that rage wrapped his fiery claws around your heart? Was that person on the internet really as stupid and contemptible as they appeared, or maybe you projected some of your unconscious hostility onto a dehumanized object, which represents something that you could squash for a sense of pseudo-empowerment. Today we're talking about projection and the uncomfortable truth that I've realized along the way, that the majority of people are mostly completely unaware of when they're projecting their own unconscious onto other people, myself included. I still fall into weekly projections despite years of learning about the psyche. I inflate into the heavens and descend down to hell, but fortunately, I've learned a few tips and tricks to be able to withdraw and dissolve these projections within a few minutes or at the most a few hours, rather than going on these long and repetitive emotional roller coasters that drain us of our energy and lead us toward ever distorted reality spaces. In today's video we're going to be looking at the dual nature of projection and ultimately reducing down to the one takeaway lesson for this video which is how to identify and dissolve your projective tendencies. The shortcut hack is to, is to focus on fixation and fascination. Fixity and fascinative, imaginal, larger than life energy, the feeling of narrowing in, your vision is really locked in on why they're wonderful or why they're dreadful, and also that sense of fascination, which can be a fascination towards disgust or a fascination towards adoration. I've got nine books I'm going to be bringing up in this video. It's going to be perhaps one of the most important videos that I put on my channel because I think that this is honestly one of the foundational skills that you really get to benefit from when it comes to inner work. If you understand the nature of projection, which is a completely normal process, projections happen. There are a form of psychologically closing distance between the known and the unknown. Think of the most immediate projective situation that you could imagine. Is this person safe or is this person a danger? You're walking down the street, someone's about 100 meters away, you project they're safe or they're unsafe and maybe certain stereotypes come in you see an elderly lady she's got her walking stick and a yorkshire terrier on the leash and she's walking really slowly even though she's really far away you project okay she's probably fine you see three young looking men wearing hoodies coming across the street and it's a whole different story Maybe that old lady has just come back from her third homicide of the day, and maybe the young men have their hands in their pockets because they're full of donations to head off to the local charity. You just don't know. However, projection is important because it keeps us safe and it allows us to close psychic distance before all the information is presented. The issue is when we do that too quickly, do that too intensely, and we fixate or fascinate without filling in the gaps in between. So let's unpack this in terms of a double, a double pronged approach on the emotional spectrum. We're going to be talking about fear and hostility and love and adoration because these are the general endpoints of projective identification. We projectively identify ourselves as someone in opposition to that which we hate and projectively identify ourselves as someone who is the worthy aspirant of love or connection or desire or lust or fantasy marriage with someone that we supposedly consider the ideal lover. I'm going to be going into two angles approach. We've got the beginning book here, uh, The Eden Project in Search of the Magical Other by James Hollis. Turning back to that in a moment, but let's begin with Hatred and Warfare with this wonderful hardcover red book by Sam Keen called Faces of the Enemy. And I want you to know that this is indeed 
the enemy. This book is a fantastic work of psychology coming out of the late 1980s, early 1990s by a Jungian psychologist who also did a lot of behind the scenes work in the former Soviet Union. He was politically maneuvering to a small degree, admittedly, but he was meeting people like Gorbachev and understanding the psychology of this American Russian projective hostility dynamic. So we have a lot to learn from not only the many different propaganda photos that we have in this book and connecting the patterns between why humans always fall into these same shadow projective tendencies. But it's an important space to go into. If you want to understand your contempt towards the idiot on the internet that you completely disagree with, we might as well go all the way into the rage of the human psyche. So a quote from the book, what's actually happening when we're projecting anger, hostility, rage, contempt, or any form of negative projective identity. Quote from Sam Keen, Faces of the Enemy. Blame produces blame. Hence, the paranoid person or nation will create a shared delusional system. He's talking about hate bonds or adversarial symbiosis. I did a video about a year ago on this idea, this adversarial locking where you mutually hate each other and through hating each other, like the left hates the right or the man hates the woman in these very unconscious dynamics, you both strangely affirm the identity of the other. Let's continue with the quote. The enemy system involves a process of two or more enemies dumping their unconscious psychological waste in each other's backyards. All we despise in ourselves, we attribute to them, and vice versa. Since this process of unconscious projection of the shadow is universal, enemies need each other to dispose of their accumulated, disowned psychological toxins. We form a hate bond, an adversarial symbiosis, an integrated system that guarantees that neither of us will be faced with our own shadow. That's the hatred angle. Let's keep this fresh in our mind and bring in the fascination angle or the love perspective, because at a certain degree of psychological detachment, although it seems like a thread between hate and love, if you've ever been in a particularly toxic relationship where it's particularly intense all of the time, you'll notice that this line, actually, if you turn it round, tends to come into a nice circle, and then you've got the looping. It's amazing, these dynamics that usually we fall into in our teenage years, or maybe, unfortunately, in our adult years, where suddenly we're shouting and arguing and smashing plates and name-calling, and then in another moment you are tussling in the bedsheets together, and aggressively resolving the solutions to, you know, you know the one, that awful toxic dynamic that no one should be in for very long. Please remove yourself from that situation. If you're in one right now, it is a waste of your energy. You deserve better and you can get better if you hear yourself. But let's create this loop connection between hatred and lust or hatred and love, fascination, whatever it may be. Turning to The Eden Project by James Hollis. Fantastic book if you want to understand about the nature of projection. Quote from the book. All projection occurs unconsciously, of course. For the moment one observes, I have made a projection. One is already in the process of taking it back. Tell you what, I have started with not the wrong quote, but I think we best start with the other quote. It's uh, just a page over, so I'm going to restart this right here. There we go. So this is about the nature of projecting onto the ideal lover, right? <sighs> the quality and character of all relationships stem from this axis, yet it is the one which is most ignored. Again, we cannot know that of which we are unconscious, but we must never forget that the unconscious is active and projecting. Since the content of of every projection is some aspect of ourselves, what we are seeing in the other is something of ourselves. It may seem ludicrous, but in this sense, what we fall in love with, key element. Bit of a messy entry to the book. That's often why I don't bring books into every single video, because you can read it for yourself. In a sense, what we fall in love with is some aspect of ourselves reflected back to us from the other. In the course of an ordinary lifetime, reason that I'm choosing this quote, in the course of an ordinary lifetime, one meets thousands of others with whom one could have a personal relationship. Yet only a certain percentage of those, perhaps several hundred, 
embody the capacity to activate our unconscious image of self and other. They provide the hook, Carl Jung suggested, to catch and hold our far-flung psychic contents. This is the idea of the anima and the animus, or the positive anima and the positive animus, the internal male and internal female, the divine masculine, divine feminine images which we hold in our heart and project out there into the world. If you find a woman or a man that is particularly good on the hook, you might be able to launch your projection. And of course, if you both launch projections to each other, we call that falling in love, of course, when you start withdrawing the projections and you realize that they are not indeed Prince Charming or the ideal princess, and it is actually a human relationship, it's often a very painful process, but understanding the psychology of that projective identification once more, the fascination and fixation axis, when you're trying to make contact with someone, you're falling in love at first sight, or as Sam Keen showed us, falling into hatred, falling into adversarial symbiosis. If you're falling into romantic fantasy and the other person is mirroring that to you, you just do a similar version of the full loop between projecting your own unconscious onto the other person. And if you've been in enough successful and unsuccessful relationships, you will have enough experiences to know what that feels like and how devastatingly painful it is when the projections fall away. You can't really tell that you're projecting because projections start from the very beginning. Every relationship begins in projection because as I mentioned at the start of the video when the elderly lady with the Yorkshire Terrier that's just committed the third homicide of the day or the three young men with their hands in their pockets ready to give to the orphans down the street, we project the gap based on stereotypes and the stereotypes are important because they keep us safe. The difficulty is when we start to have stereotypes around race, or gender, or age, or certain political attributes, let's say, that keep us from knowing the other, or form too much of a psychic barrier that defends us from their actual identity, and that often leads us into very tricky space. Where do we take this? I think I'll actually read back that second quote that I started with in this wonderfully messy, organic, one-take teaching moment. So the quote that I was going to say, more commonly, we only begin to, again, it's a quote from this book, more commonly, we only begin to reclaim our purchase on consciousness when the other fails to catch, hold, and reflect our projection. Now we're talking about the moment of when the projections fail, they are bound to fail, and this is what we do to navigate that in between. If there is a central law of the psyche, it is that which is unconscious will be projected. This is why Jung observed that when an inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside as fate. But since the psyche consists of a multitude of split-off shards of energy, complexes, and archetypal forms to which Jung granted near-mythological status with names like the anima, the animus, and the shadow, virtually all, key sentence, virtually all of which are unconscious, there is always an ample opportunity for projection. I'm going into it one more time with that quote because I need to really emphasize the projection is completely normal. You can read a book like this one up on the screen, Projection and Recollection by Marie-Louise von Franz, if you want to go into the deep academics, but you honestly don't. I've got six more books to share. I'm going to share them right at the end. You need to understand that it's normal because if you can catch yourself in the moment of projecting outwards in love or fascination or hatred and contempt and you realize that there's been a psychic gap between you, you can feel the moment of separating out your consciousness and you can catch that. The catching is the beginning of the withdrawing. I'll make this personal because the books are feeling stale. Sometimes in these videos I try and give as many resources as I possibly can and try and encourage you to read the materials that will give far more than a single YouTube video, but they get stagnant, they get stuck, and I actually would rather speak from my experience, but I bring in the book so that you can have something that lasts beyond the video, and you can see that in this video in particular, it didn't quite work, it was a bit sticky, it was a bit stuck, because I'm trying to hold up the books as the projected authority figures, rather than just speaking from my own authority, and then there's a bit of rage that comes up. 
already catching a bit of a dynamic in this moment, but let's make it a little bit more extreme and hopefully practical for you. What happens when I am projecting or when I realize I'm projecting, it's usually one of two things. I notice the hatred, I notice the love or the lust. And at this point in my journey, I know that if certain issues really trigger me in either direction, it is almost 100% a projection. A projection might be layered on a reality. Maybe that woman is indeed stunning. Maybe she is indeed the most creative, beautiful, articulate, inspirational woman that I have ever seen. And I have found my soul made my twin flame to last me another 1000 lifetimes. Or maybe she's just a very impressive woman and I'm layering a lot on and I also don't know who she is because I just saw her on the internet for the first time and I should probably catch myself before this gets too strong. Maybe when I also go on the internet later that day, I'm on YouTube and I get recommended a video from something happening in American politics, which isn't even anything really to do with me because I'm in the UK and I see a certain issue about a certain controversial subject, which I'm not going to name. But certain controversial issues happening in America right now, where there are clearly evil things happening to very vulnerable people, I watch some of these videos and I feel rage that we could allow this to happen to vulnerable people. I feel such anger, seething, righteous anger that this cannot continue and this is wrong. I'm playing into it in the video. Where am I projecting? Well, maybe there is something morally wrong about exploiting vulnerable people, but I'm also adding on a layer of projection. This is where we get to the really complex territory for this video. The hook idea, the idea of a hateful hook or a loving hook. A projection cannot land unless the hook is there. So if someone is truly beautiful, truly inspirational, and your heart starts to get Ooh, all kinds of shivers and goosebumps and you're thinking about them late at night, it's because they are genuinely at least a few of these attributes. And the same with the situation which brings about contempt and rage. There's something to be upset about. There's something which is worthy of being challenged. It's your job to realize how intense you're being, how much distance you've created, but also then paradoxically knowing how to have strong moral values without being swept up in the projection. It's easier to identify this when it comes to hatred. Let's go again with the unnamed situation that I find myself in these rageful loops with when I'm on the internet, these exploitative situations that I despise. I believe that they are morally wrong. I believe that this is genuine evil that's happening out there in the world. But how am I served from projecting hateful rhetoric or getting into this state myself of criticizing and condemning rather than just holding that moral value, doing what I can when there's a moment to stand up against something, but also realizing this is a political issue that is 3,000 miles away, doesn't affect me personally, is taking away the energy that I could give to the next video or to my loved ones, people who are close to me, people who genuinely could do with my positive energy and I'm allowing myself to sink all the way down. I've descended into hell. You can have a moral conviction that something is wrong or you can have an emotional experience that someone's fascinating and beautiful and an instant connection and they're just so wonderful without being swept up by the intensity. Maybe that man or woman is indeed the most beautiful person that you've ever seen, and they will be your future partner for life. But just focus on the maybe. Just focus on how much psychological distance you've set up, and how much pedestalization has just occurred. Give it time. Give both of them time. Reduce the hatred, reduce the love and the lust. Give it multiple months, see how you feel. If there's something that's happening in your immediate environment, and it's a case of, let's say you need to act quickly on something, and you need to make a decision that's informed by your emotions and your rationality together, try and step out and consider the opposites. Try and play the devil's advocate of, hmm, maybe this beautiful woman is actually, ooh, maybe they're quite narcissistic. Maybe actually they're being deceitful. If I look a bit closer, they're doing this strange language pattern where they're, ooh, Maybe in the hatred side, it's like, oh, actually, I can imagine that the reason that these people are uh, 
it's difficult for me to even certain things are evil right certain things are evil but maybe they're not and that's the real challenge that's why i still get caught up in projections if you're truly honest about your own psychological territory you will have strong biases and strong boundaries where certain behaviors are evil and certain types of people are good the job of psychological maturity is collapsing it inwards and still having a conviction without being lopsided without being swept away in the currents of your own emotion you can tell when you're projecting because you get fixated or fascinated and the emotions come up very strongly but just because you're projecting doesn't mean that it was complete unreality some things are real and our subjective layering is what makes it uncomfortable or makes it overly charged this is when we get into fantasy space another clue for the video if you notice you start fantasizing either revenge fantasies or romantic fantasies you're probably caught in a bit of a projection number one invitation for the video is to educate yourself once you know these basic principles the number one way to actually remove both patterns and find yourself in the middle ground where you set yourself in reality and don't get swept up in fantasy is education so i've got three more books to help you with the romantic side and the hateful vengeful side let's go with romance first three books gonna rapidly list them off we've got we by Robert Johnson, fantastic book if you're looking for an entry point into masculine feminine romantic space. We've got Facing Love Addiction by Pierre Melody, a very practical self-development style book for love addicts, which is anyone, if you're honest with yourself, who fantasizes and projects towards the ideal man or woman. And then a book that I've been recommending very often on this channel, The Invisible Partners by John Sanford. Very much the same as these two other books. If you read just these three books, you'll be quite capable of catching the projection and the idealization, and it will catch you for maybe a few hours, at most a few days, but you're not going to lose years of your life getting caught into some kind of fantasy about soulmates or twin flames or the perfect husband, the perfect wife, and how they're... Uh, uh, you're not going to do that. You're not going to waste your time. You're going to have an earthy, grounded, mature, loving relationship with someone who's also giving all those grander qualities for better and for worse to have something real rather than projective fantasy dissociated space you can see i have a lot of issues with that anyway let's go into the aspects of evil and this is on the other side we've got evil again by john sanford this is a fantastic book for shadow projection and the psychology of hatred and hostility and then these wonderful two black books which you may not be able to see unless i get it there there we go. We've got The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness by Eric Fromm and The Roots of War and Terror by Anthony Stevens. These books are going in my shadow work course. In fact, the majority of these books are going in the overall inner work course because they're such fantastic reads. You're getting them now. You don't need to wait months. The reason these little black books, or rather this big black book on the nature of destruction, violence, hatred, animosity, and human warfare and violence is a worthwhile read is if you know what it's like to be a human at the extreme, you can catch yourself before you become an extremist in both love and warfare. Educate yourself about what it means to be a human with a human mind. Catch yourself when you're projecting through the distances and you will be on such solid footing to walk through the rest of your life. Being able to go on these experiences of emotional roller coasters here and there, but just giving yourself a couple minutes on that ride rather than wasting many years of your life in a place that you don't necessarily want to be. I hope this video has been useful. It was a bit of a messy video at times, but another lesson for me as I'm working through these 500 episodes to not try and put too many books into a video when I already speak about this topic week in, week out with clients and probably didn't even need to bring up a single book. Always a good moment for me to remember, but nonetheless, I share the books to my detriment and to the detriment of making a fluid video just so that you buy the books for yourself. Once more, first two books I held up, these are the core ones of the video, Faces of the Enemy by Sam Keen and The Eden Project by James Hollis. Nine books in this video, your projections will start to become dissolved if you pick up even just two of them. I'll leave that to you, and I'll see you in the next video. It's over here.